pleased to introduce Larry Jos Jos Josephowski. I had it right like 12 times and now I'm messing it up. <laughs> anyway, Larry is the current IT director for the city of Dover. He oversees a staff of four and he manages all IT and cybersecurity needs for our capital city. He previously worked for 20 plus years in IT for Delmarva Power and Exelon, and he also served in communications and IT for the U.S. Army and Army Reserve, retiring in 2015. He has a B.S. in Business Administration and an M.S. in Public Administration from Wilmington University, and certificates in Project Management and IT Leadership from the University of Delaware. So please welcome Larry. Make sure I get this right. Okay, real quickly, um, a little bit about the uh, city of Dover. We have about six sites spread throughout the city with another one coming online in the spring, we believe. The city's budget, and I, I put these figures out there to give you an idea about where we stand in terms of, because we do have cybersecurity insurance right now, and to give you a, a kind of a concept of where we're at, what, the, what I'm gonna give you what we pay and compare to what we do. Um, our city, city of Dover's budget is about 195 million. We have about 300 employees, and our, our, our IT staff is me, three, administ three system administrators, and a programmer. And we don't have a dedicated cybersecurity resource yet. And I point that out because that is something that is becoming kind of an important thing. You know, and I guess the first question, and hopefully that's why you're here, is why cybersecurity insurance? And there is a lot of interest in that, particularly because you can't turn the almost turn on a news or turn over a newspaper without seeing things. Cybersecurity insurance is a multi-billion-dollar market. In 2021, it was about 7.5 billion, and it's expected to go to over 20 billion with the United States itself having about two and a half billion dollars in policies. And what does it do? Well, cybersecurity insurance helps an organization pay for the financial losses that may result in the event of a cybersecurity attack or a data breach, as well as covering or providing resources for, the, for crisis communication, legal services, and customer refunds, and some other things. And, and there are some organizations that have to have it because of regulatory or because of other insurance that they may have. They have to have it. Um, as an entity, a lot of public entities don't necessarily have to have it. And, and some, large or some large places, some large cities don't have that. But it does provide a security blanket. So it provides a security blanket for your senior management. It provides a security blanket for your... Um, elected officials if you're in, the, in that kind of organization. And of course, cybersecurity, as, as we just heard, is ties directly, mostly ties into issues regarding attacks on our infrastructure. And it continues. In the last three years, the number of attacks, the number of claims actually has risen 100%, which I think was like $18 billion in a recent year in, in claims. And, and that can be very costly. Um, I think Baltimore's, city of Baltimore got attacked and their cost was $18 million. And of course, you know, the, what gets, the, what gets the, uh, the headlines is a lot of times is the ransomware. Because the ransomware, of course, is that's, you know, some, we, we see some shadow entity going away and getting away with, you know, whatever the amount that they may be. But of course, that's only part of the cost. The downtime that you may have, the downtime that a business, a downtown that a government may have can exceed the cost of that. A lot of times after an attack, it, one of the, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but one of the good things about an attack is that it can, it can certainly highlight where you need to upgrade your system. And that's definitely part of, a lot of times that becomes part of the cost of a, of a cybersecurity attack. And of course, if you do get attacked, you know, it's going to cost you more. Just like if you have an automobile accident, if you, have an, if you get hit with a cybersecurity, they have a, uh, one, the one we just filled out has a five-year look back. They want to know if you've had any incidents over the last five years. Um, and the average, you know, and the ransom cost, 
The ransomware costs have decreased a little bit, mainly due to the fact that with cybersecurity insurance or specific firms that do negotiate, we realize that these people, they're in business, like, like a lot of us are, they negotiate. They don't want to, they don't want to drag this out. Um, the average, and again, just for uh, the average insurance claim cost that, that comes up is 300, about $350,000. The average insurance claim is 350. The average cost of an attack is like 500,000, which means, of course, we have to pay for that. And, and of course, that's subject to, subject to all kinds of variables. One, one municipality recently had 500 records, 500 HIPAA, they had HIPAA records, 500 of them. Seems fairly small to most of us. I mean, I think the city of Dover has like 38 to 40,000 people in there. What's 500 records? 500 records is $350,000 is what it costs. Now, a lot of this is focused on smaller organizations and specifically what this one's about is about our, um, is our um, state, local, territory, and tribal territories. And, but I, th this, I can encompass this to almost any organization, particularly a smaller organization. And I'm glad that uh, my, my uh, corporate experience gets highlighted a little bit because if you work in that kind of environment, and, and they do get hit, but there is, it is a different feeling towards cybersecurity, a different feeling towards um, upgrades um, in the sense that the money's there usually. There's not as much of trying to stretch things out. But we're valuable, why? Because first of all, we have a wealth of valuable data. In addition to what's listed there, there is really no type of limit that an organization may have. Uh, employee data is valuable, uh, medical, police, liens, licensing. And we, talk, we heard this morning about 23andMe with possibly with your DNA genomes and all, all that. That certainly is, you know, gets a little bit more scary every time we think about it. The list of data that you may, that may be subject to um, theft, that's subject to blackmail, is, is pretty much as varied as their organizations. And, and, what, and why else are we targeted? Well, one is budget restraints. You know, we've got a whole room full of people out there that are willing to make us as safe as we can afford. The problem is most of us can't afford every single thing out there. I'm sure they would like, like us to, but it is a very, we have budget restraints no, no matter what time. And it doesn't take, a very sm doesn't take a very smart, bad agent to realize our budgets are limited. There, and we have this temptation to always get one more year out of our equipment. And of course, the problem is that one more year becomes two more years and five more years. And, and a perfect example, and um, a few people in the room um, are aware of it, but shortly after I, I took over down in Dover, I was handed a list of our capital assets, and it was a big list. I don't think anyone had really looked at it for several years. They kind of just pencil whipped it and made it through. And so I figured, well, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the honest thing. I'm gonna look at it. So I thought it came in an Excel spreadsheet. So what I did is I sorted it by age of the asset, figuring something older is less likely, and I can simply cross it off the list. And I did that. And when I did that, I recognized that we had, one of the items that we had was an old Cisco router that I, when I was first started in IT in 90, 98, 99, I bought the same exact Cisco router. So I talked to my uh, tech at the time. I'm like, well, hey, I just, I'm sure we don't have a 23-year-old router in place, right? He goes, um, actually, we, we, we do. And what, and it was, um, it was actually kind of, it was worse than that, really, because what it was, it was used to connect to, we pulled data from a few PCs at our, at, our, um, at our volunteer fire station, which is on its own separate network, has its own special, has its own managed service provider. Um, and we had, some access, we had some access lists on that device to control, we were pulling data for fire and and, and uh, 911 calls off of some PCs in there. But we basically had a bridge network. We had some access lists, but 23-year-old Cisco device. And of course, we replaced it for about $100. $100 device replaced it. But, and I suspect that's not the, um, it was, it's probably the worst example, but certainly not the only one. 
Um, another element of the cost of it um, is the cost of the tools needed to monitor the network. We have all of our vendors out there. The list of tools, the firewalls, web filters, EDR, IDS, uh, SIMS, backup, data loss prevention, a, a testing environment. And I mentioned it because I'm going to mention them a little bit later in terms of the cybersecurity incident. Of course, there is definitely the costs continue. We had someone recently who wanted to hold on to a laptop, an old laptop, uh, for a spare. But when you start adding up the cost of additional licensing, additional EDR, that free computer starts, certainly starts costing a lot of money. And as for our IT staff and uh, experience and training, um, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of turnover. Isn't that right, Teresa? Yeah. <laughs> Teresa used to work for me until she got a better deal. So uh, uh, I didn't expect her to be here, but uh, um, for, and we have a lot of reasons. People want to specialize. Uh, people want people want money. Um, and, and and again, going back to the corporate environment, when we first started, when I first got there, we were and, and from a city environment and probably from a small organization point of view, we were paying. Um, I was paying. In the corporate environment, I was paying interns what I was paying my, my technicians. Um, right now, my average network person has been with the company for 10 months. And they're fairly, and they're fairly new to the field. Um, I'm doubt that I'm different I'm that in that area that we're much different than most of you. Um, so the lack of experience can make one valuable, uh, vulnerable. We talk about standardization. And again, that's one of the things that large organizations do a really good job at, but the smaller you get, I think, the more difficult it is to maintain those standards. It takes money, it takes the ability and to enforce those standards. And part of it is that it takes, it takes manpower. The, when I worked for the power company, we had someone whose job it was to set standards, set access control, um, and it, it, in a way, it makes it a bureaucratic nightmare, but at the same time, you knew that your stuff was managed, there was change, there was change management, there was incident management, and that stuff was tracked. Um, so basically, it is expensive to, to do this. Now, insurance, you know, what does it cover? Well, like any insurance policy, it can cover whatever you want it to cover or whatever you don't want it to cover, and there are exceptions. But these are some of the uh, most common things. There's a few on here that, you know, the cyber extortion. When the, when the threat actors have broken through your security and have gained access to your valuable access, uh, confidential data, intellectual property, financial, currents, financial currency, infrastructure systems, that's when they've got something they have and, you, and they shouldn't have and you want it back. Now, related, of course, is the malware infections. It certainly could be related to the extortion, but could also just be a bit broader. And maybe the actors have, they may not have somehow gotten your data, maybe your data is encrypted, and, you know, encrypted in place and they don't have it, but they still have control of your systems. Uh, it could just be uh, disruptive. It's still a pain to, to deal with. Now we talk about the fraudulent email and compromise. Um, not all cyber attacks use, use viruses or email. Some are a lot simpler. Has, has anyone seen the email where if someone says, hey, I, I'm, from, I'm Bob from, uh, from, I'm a Bob from the uh, tree department. I want to change my bank account. Well, that, that, it's getting a little better. But again, we had one situation where it got to the point where um, our HR had started to enter the data, had started to change the banking data. Fortunately, they, they, we pulled it back. But that's another area that's, cyber, that's fraud. That's fraud, that's cybersecurity that may, may get covered. You know, we talked about MGM Studios, and that's one of those, one of our touchstones probably for the next year or so until something worse comes along. Um, it wasn't malware, it wasn't Trojan, it wasn't an email. It was the help desk. It was the help desk falling prey to social engineering. Someone looked up their profile on LinkedIn, uh, called the service desk, and the service desk reset their password which gave them admin rights and the keys to the kingdom. Exfiltration. Sometimes we don't need a bad guy to lose the data. And again, but this is still a, a vulnerability. It's still possibly a, a cybersecurity cyber insurance event. We tend to focus on the bad guys, but sometimes it's the not so bad guys or even what we think are good guys. Um, a few years ago, um, a local uh, credit union had an issue where 
their programmer was wanted to do some wanted to get some caught up on some work a little bit. So they uh, they took the they took some data they put it on a thumb drive and took it home with them. Well, that's it was it was the customer data with all the banking information, account numbers, balances, the whole nine yards. Um, and they decided that would be easier to do rather than you know get their computer or rather get their the work computer, the work laptop, VPN into the system and do all that. So they just took it on and put it on their personal computer, which, you know, I think pe I saw people, you know, starting to, you know, shudder when that happens. What did it cost that company? Well, it, it didn't cost them really that much. It cost someone their job, but it, but it also cost them, they had to notify their employees. They had to, so basically there's a reputation loss at that point. Um, The other one is that we, talk, we don't think about is, uh, it's not on my list here, but as I was going through our recent cybersecurity insurance profile, one of the things that come up was about social media. Social media is also usually covered under cybersecurity. This covers a, a bit of the dis where information was disclosed, our slander, our libel, our copyright, uh, uh, copyright infringement. A bit beyond maybe what some of us do, but it's certainly covered under the cybersecurity umbrella. Of course, the liability is, that's a very broad category to cover all these things. The cost of remediation, the cost of recovery, the cost of identity theft insurance. Now, what do you get when you pay for cybersecurity insurance? Well, you can't go anywhere without lawyers. Um, and, and in that situation, you know, and, and of course, I would also point out that insurance companies, has anyone ever dealt with an insurance company that was looking forward to giving out money? they're going to do everything possible to avoid paying out. They have a vested interest in getting you to do everything possible, avoid for them having to spend money. Lawyers, well, they don't, they don't pay for the lawyers, of course, but they have them there for legal teams that are the preferred users. And this is usually the first thing that's going to happen. The first thing that's probably going to happen if you get hit is that you call your insurance company, they're going to, to take over. And one of the first things they're going to do is have a, a lawyer to figure out what they have to do, what they don't have to do. Um, and what they can, you know, what, what needs to be done. And it's the same for the second item on the forensic firms. Trying to figure out what you, trying to figure out when you've got other fires to put out, isn't the time to try to start Googling what your issues are. Having a vetted list of successful vendors is a good service to have at that point. I mentioned earlier about ransomware um, interdiction and negotiation. One of the first things they'll say is don't talk to you, you and I, particularly if, uh, if I'm talking to the IT people. You know, we, we made a joke earlier about we're not always the most social people in the world, um, or maybe the most, you know, people type of people. So they said don't, we don't talk to, don't talk to the, don't talk to the ransomware people. And part of it is that they know, they know what buttons to push. They provide the team that's going to attempt to cut the amount they will have to pay. However, and you go, once, you, once you have a ransomware, a lot of this stuff is out of your, uh, out of your hands. And, and, but generally speaking, it's not a long process. The negotiations with the bad actors, first of all, they don't speak English usually because um, they're coming from a foreign country. So we're using Google Translator. And it's usually, it doesn't take long. It's like 10, 15 exchanges back and forth where they're negotiating. Uh, data recovery. Hopefully, everyone's got secure backups, air gap backups, and, and that comes in play when you're trying to get insurance. But that may be part, that may be part of the services that you, you, you get. Same with identity theft services. That's sort of, we've all, I'm sure we've all at this point, have gotten that letter or that email from our bank or government, whoever, saying, you know, your identity may have been compromised. We've got an identity lock on your identity for the next, you know, 30 a year or so. Crisis communications. Um, there's a lot to cover in a crisis, and depending on the, co the type of company you are, you know, whether you're, the go I mean, if you're a government agency, if you're a private agency, people want to know what gets communicated, when it gets communicated, and who does the communication are all important. Uh, the cybersecurity may, may advise, or in some cases, particularly in large cases, they may have a public services firm to take over. Um, training. This is one of those areas, to hammer the point home, 
they don't want to pay out, and they know that the biggest vulnerability is the person sitting behind the computer. One of our insurance companies that we do provides some free training. Initially, it was for a limited number of users, but they've expanded. They realize um, it doesn't do good to train 20 or 30 people when everyone needs the training. Now, again, uh, working, for the, working for the city of Dover, we use the state of Delaware's provided training, but we did use these, the insurance companies for our it was more, it was a little bit friendlier type training, so we use that for our executives and our elected officials trying to encourage them to take some, some training. Uh, metrics. One of the things that the, insur the insurance company will do, and I'm going to save some of the specifics for later, but the, train, the trend is for insurance company to want a more accurate, I, I would say intrusive, look at your network. This is beginning to do in its infancy, but it does give you some uh, independent metrics that aren't your created metrics for showing to your executives on where you stand in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, tabletop exercises. One of the services that our insurance company provides us is that we get invited to tabletop exercises and one of the things that it really does is it a lot of times it involves your different parts of your company or your agency. Uh, one time last year I think it was the tabletop involved Losing basically lost using a mail using a mail um, a scam. They basically the, this tabletop was that they had taken they had the whole pay, the whole payroll got stolen, and of course so is that really an IT issue at that point? It, it's really I mean it's, the money's gone. It really I mean they, they were they answered emails that they thought were correct. So from an IT point of view, it's not really an IT issue, but it, it's a it's a cyber it's a cyber security issue, and it's a training issue. And I will say that um, these value-added services that you get when you have an insurance company, um, they're they're not free. And um, just saying that you have a five hundred thousand dollar life ins life insurance life insurance is a lot cheaper than cyber security insurance. Uh, my joke is that they should put a million dollars on me and then if something happens they can off me and they would save a lot of money. Um, but you don't have, but when, when, this, when the crap hits the fan, you don't have a lot of choices. And, and, and these things, and they're going to, and the insurance company are going to hire the best, the best ones they can get a hold of. It's going to cost a lot of money. One recent example, uh, they had like a, I think it was a $500,000 policy and, the, and they didn't pay ransom but the insurance company spent 300,000 of it on the various forms of remediation. Now, the other question I would ask, and this is a question we're asking ourselves right now is, well, do we really need insurance? Um, as I said, first of all, the ransomware, they're not paying ransomware anymore. They're really trying to avoid that. In some cases, some big cases, I think it was at San Francisco, where they, uh, they got hit, I think it was the police union that got, they got their data, and the city said, oh, we're not paying. We'll, we'll deal with the people, individual, we'll do identity, we'll do the identity protection. Of course, that, re that presents its own set of issues with, with the organization. You know, again, they're doing more of a triage situation, and the recovery may be more important than the exposure. Um, the cost, ransom, that's probably one of the biggest things. How much is it gonna cost? Ransomware is getting uh, more expensive every year. Uh, when I started two years ago, this is my third iteration of, of going through the insurance thing, we paid, um, we have two policies, we have, I think uh, we have a total of, I think we have $2 million insurance. And we went from, for, for, but for one, for one of the $1 million policies, we went from paying $12,500 a couple years ago to $25,000 the next year to $33,000 um, last year for the current year. So we're paying $33,000 um, and I expect it to go up to 30, probably close to $40,000 this year. Um, so for, for the insurance that we had, it was uh, one paid off in the, one paid off after the other one. It was like a total of $50,000 for $2 million worth of insurance. Increase in exclusions. More exclusions are creeping in the policies. Expre ways that they can void the coverage, expenses like legal fees and, and lost revenue. Those are starting to go away because they don't, first of all, it's hard to define. Um, how much legal fees are you going to have if something bad happens? 
And the second thing is, is that um, loss of business, how long are you going to be down? There's some things that insurance companies like to be able to calculate risk. They like to be able to figure out what the, 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 the totals are. And, and that starts, they're getting better at it, but those are some of the areas that are problematic. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting, once you have cybersecurity insurance, for, when you go through the policy, you see all, there's a, it's a, uh, I'll talk about that later, that you, you put the policy in, we had the policy in, we, we, we applied for a renewal, and they will say, oh, if you want to continue that insurance, you're going to have to buy something. Now, from an IT security, now, from my point of view, as an IT person, this is good, because well, if, if, you want the, if you want the insurance, I've been, something that's been on my wish list for a while, perhaps. For instance, um, the first year we needed, um, and we needed MFA for every instance of use on the network for our admin accounts. That sounds like a good thing, right? I mean, you know, so we got the UB keys and, and we're, we're, we're happy with them. Um, it cost me, I think, a, a couple thousand dollars or something to implement that. I had that, in my, I had that in my budget, I had no issues. Now we do it again last year, and they said, oh, if you want to maintain your current level insurance at your current best policy rates, you got to implement a SIM. A SIM? So this was like in November or something, they tell us this, and we have like, in like a month to put in Splunk, which we put in, we put in Splunk. Teresa helped put that in, and $20,000. So in order to maintain my insurance, in order to spend $35,000, I had to spend another $20,000. And we'll have to spend $20,000 this year. So that's going to happen. And, and that's, you know, that's probably, you know, and, and I try to prod my insurance company, well, what are you going to, what's the surprise going to be this year? And, you know, all you can do is take your, your best guesses. The other thing that's happening is that attackers are starting to get a little smart. They're going through they're going through various forms of data, various forms of disclosure to find out if you have cybersecurity insurance. If you have, if you have, a, if you have a regulatory requirement, a legal requirement, or if you're in the city and you have a budget that says that, they know you got cybersecurity insurance. So they know how much, gives them a rough idea how much your data is worth and, and how much you're willing to pay for it. Um, and, and I really do believe that these, these uh, are going to, uh, the processes and procedures are going to get more intrusive. Um, think of um, safe driving detectors in your car, where I think it was all state has a safe driver discount. If you put a plug something into your car and you monitor, and if you're a safe driver, you get, you get, you get a, well, actually, I guess you get, if, if you're not a safe driver, you get worse than that, you know. And that's what they're doing in cybersecurity. They're developing different connectors to help determine how secure or compliant you are. Um, the training is the least intrusive right now. I mean, right now, Every company I've dealt with says, do you do training? But remember I said that the insurance companies are offering their own free training? I suspect that sooner or later they're going to require you to come, that, that they're going to have to complete their training to continue to get a discount. Um, so really the question is about why not insurance, in, in, in my case for instance. Thirty-five dollars to $50,000 a year is, is for a, an organization our size. Is it worth it? Or could I use that thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars in another area to make us more secure? I can go out there and buy buy some cool stuff. But as I said, there are some upside of the insurance. I've mentioned some of these already. That the you know the premiums are continuing to rise, but it looks like they're going to be the, the, the insurance companies have figured out what their risk levels are, and the increases are not going up quite as quick. It used to be a twenty to thirty percent increase a year. Um, <coughs> now we're probably talking 10% for now. And as I said, a fair, to, to get this policy, you've got to go through a ri pretty rigorous self-examination. We did it recently. I think it took us about an hour and a half. To, I did it as a, group of, as a group exercise with my team, and it took us about an hour and a half to, to complete that, the, the questions. Uh, I think there were like 80 questions. And of course, there are other checklists, but for decision makers, the ones that come from an insurer may, may carry more weight. And I will say that the insurance questions are getting more smart, I guess. Rather than saying, do you have an antivirus program? They're saying, oh, well, what kind do you have? 
what, what, what versions do you have? What, you know, what's, what add-ons, if you have, a, if you have um, EDR, what, what do you, what's the name of it and what are all the patches that you have? Um, and the questions are becoming more like one of our, the, uh, you know, the, the NCSR, NIST, or the CIS controls. They're becoming more like that. Um, and of course, the knowledge is you have to answer these honestly, as they're not going to pay if you give a, a wrong answer. And it says, time goes on in the historical, and there's more historical data, the actual risks and the control measures needed is becoming known. That, that should tend to level out the, the policy. Um, you know, processes make companies more able to pay. You know, uh, there's some reasons why. One is that, you know, this, one of the things that, um, the reason why it's a little less than it used to be, cryptocurrency. Well, cryptocurrencies, if you've been following it, are not as secure as the bad guys would like, since there's, a, there's, there's I guess, rumors are that we've cracked some cases of, of, a, of it. And that's actually what they do. The, sometimes the insurance companies will also negotiate, part of the negotiation is which platform of si cryptocurrency are they going to use? So, and so, so the regardless of whether you have insurance or not, and, 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 you're not and you're not going to get insurance if you don't have these things. So I've got a better slide coming up, but the point here is that you're going to, there's a lot of things that it's not going to cover a lot of your, it's not going to cover your sins. If you've got issues, you're going to have to get them addressed before you're going to, and they're getting more selective on who they did. Um, you know, some of the questions that we get asked on, that, on our last one was, uh, do you have a dedicated staff measuring a security operations center? Is it 24 hours or is it a third party? You know, what is your triage time for incidents? If you get a security incident on a computer, how quickly do you, do you resolve it? What percentage of your time, uh, I mentioned about the phishing training. Anybody do phishing training in their environment? Well, basically they want to know, well, how, what percentage of your people fell victim to the phishing event? And again, right now they're taking my word for it, which we, you know, I, I, we keep the metrics, but the, the one insurance that we use, they have their own phishing tool. So I think sooner or later they're going to say, oh, we kind of trust you, but not really. So we're going to want you to follow, we want you to use our tool for that. Um, how do you handle privileged accounts? Do you use MFA? Uh, do, you log, do you log your account act? What kind, do you log account access and which, what logs do you maintain? What kind of backup do you have? Um, you know, we mentioned about other areas that come into play. One thing was that the financial questions. I mean, my cybersecurity insurance, I had to go across the hall to talk to our financial people and say, hey, do you have a process if someone calls for wire transfers? Do you have a process for do you take, if someone calls and says they need money, if someone sends an email and says they, you know, they want to change of address, do you have processes in place to ensure that there's a double check on there? You know, social media, I spent time with our public affairs person because some of the questions are dealing with that. Are you, how, how much information are you sharing on, on social media? So, and this is kind of a cool slide because it really shows, I think, should be familiar to a lot of us. It's the IT security controls. And pretty much, um, I would say, first of all, from an from a insurance perspective, I don't know of too many people that have all the blocks checked. And, and we don't. We don't have the most, a lot of our blocks are like, you know what, we don't do that yet. We'd love to. You give me more money and I would do it. But, but some of these things are probably more important than others. And you have to pick and choose which ones are the most important and which ones we can afford. Um, you know, some of these have, so far have been non-negotiable. The multi-factor authentication, the EDR instead of antivirus is becoming the, um, the requirement. Backups, what you're doing with your backups. Do you have them air gap? Do you have them off-site, on-site? Um, again, I mentioned about the privileged access management. You know, this, right now what we have is good enough. But, you know, the, the one thing that I've noticed I think is gaining a little bit more visibility is end-of-life asset and end-of-life plan and asset management. They want to make sure you're keeping track of your old computers. What are you doing with them? What's your plans? Is your, are you keeping the assets on the, on the network longer than you should? And I will note one final thing about that is that as time goes on, they're asking for more documentation of this information. Um, and I, I think in the next couple of years it's going to get much more worth. Uh, supply chain, we'll talk about supply chain management on this slide. 
This is an a example of what I mentioned about the insurance company being somewhat um, intrusive in terms of, um, of the data. Well, this is insurance company rating, us, rating the organization on different areas. Now, uh, if I can remember right, the, the, the scale is their own company scale, and it's almost not important, but that's a range of companies that they have. The green is the uh, standard for whatever organization. In our case, it was our small to medium-sized cities. And the blue was where we stood, another way around. The blue was where the standard was, the green is where we were. So we did, we did fairly well. But I guess how they get this data. This is from the insurance company's website, not, not from my website. And it, you know, the, network, you know, the network security it measures the strength of the network organization, um, whether, you have the, whether you have best practices like encryption, patching. How often do you patch your, your systems and threat migration? It also checks for vulnerabilities, malware, misconfiguration. And it gives us, in this case, it gives us a, re uh, a report on what we need to, to fix. Um, I'll, skip, you know, I'll skip a couple of them. I think we, let's see what time we got? We're running a little, I think we got well. Um, funds transfer, uh, those are the, it tracks the markers related to the hacking of email and phishing that commonly leads to bad activities. Um, again, all these are measuring basically what, you know, how, cyber extortion, how vulnerable are you to cyber extortion? The one that I think was cool is the dark intelligence. You know, what they do is, that, and they'll tell you, like, they won't give you a lot of the details unless you pay more money, but what they'll say is that, hey, we went out to the dark web and we found, I think in this case it was, we found two or three documents with your, with your organization's data on it. Now, I'm curious, but I'm not curious enough to go to the dark web to, to find out. Um, but, but that's what they do. And the same with the, the other one is supply chain. Supply chain is another one that, again, IT, what does IT have to do with side chain? Well, it, there's it, a lot of times it's what are your vendors? Something's sort of out of our control, but what? How are our vendors protected? Where, where are they at? I mean, are th are we in an area that's been hit before? And the way they do this is they have connectors. Part of your tool that you have is they have connectors. Right now, it's like uh, Microsoft Security Security Store, uh, AWS, and, and Google are some of the co connectors that they have. But ultimately, what it comes down to is your insurance is, you know, these are the kind of questions that you really have to ask yourself. You know, what's, what's your financial stability? What, how much, how much, what's your budget like? Can you really afford the extra cost? A and or, would you be better spending that money elsewhere? And what are your, uh, what are your senior manager, you know, what is, what's regulatory? What do your senior management feel? What do your elected officials feel? Um, they don't want to get caught blindsided by something like this. Um, and are the, coverage, are the coverage exemptions becoming unreasonable? I mean, I suspect that in my organization that if we get a, I don't know, you have to have another tool. You have to have another $10,000, $20,000 tool. I, I think they're going to like, you know, there's certainly going to be a push not to, not to renew. Um, as I said, I mentioned about Splunk. Splunk was on my wish list. Um, Having to, have, having to install it in about, a, about three weeks was not my wish list, around Christmas time. Um, and again, how good are your cybersecurity controls? Uh, what do you have in place? Do you have EDR? Do you, ever, do you patch your servers regularly or workstations regularly? Do you have a good change management system? Um, how developed is your incident response plan? Which is really the question that you have to answer. If the bad guys hit, what are you, what are you going to do? Um, and do you have the staff to do it? Do you have a staff to track all these things? So that's really the question that you have to, and, and, we, and I will say that as someone who's had it for a couple years, we are, we are, we're probably going to be evaluated depending on what the price is going to be coming up this year. So uh, I think that concludes it. Do, are there any questions? There's a lot of conversations around large organizations and cybersecurity. Is there a use case for small businesses where you know, you're a nine-person roofing company, you do, you know, 500,000 or a million a year. You've got client data, right? You've got invoicing, you've got, you know, HR information. It, is there a use case to scale down a cyber insurance solution for an organization that size? 
There is. I mean, these insurance companies will scale down because, um, but th the problem is your data is valuable and it's, it's almost more value. And it may be to the point that's more valuable than, I mean, they'll scale it down. But again, all nine person company, do you, I mean, do they do the backups? Do they have an EDR solution? Do they have all those things in place? And the, the answer, you know, the, the, I'm sure an insurance company will offer you a policy, you know, <laughs> The question is how affordable it's going to be. And, and I would think that, and I think we run into that with in the, the, in the municipal world, that every municipality has got property data and all this data, but you know, we're the, we're the second largest city in the state and, and I don't have cybersecurity, dedicated cybersecurity assets. So it gets real difficult. Sure. On a personal basis, one of the areas you mentioned was identity. And on a personal basis, I've tried a variety of systems. <coughs> and it, by and large, it didn't insure what I would, didn't give me what I would call insurance. You know, uh, financial remuneration. What they gave was advice and counsel. There seemed to be two aspects. They tell you if you've been compromised, which is almost public knowledge with these very large number of, of compromises. And two, advice on what to do, but the advice was very common sense and anyone in our field, quite frankly, in my opinion, would know that. So, are there, on the identity theft side, uh, firms that actually remunerate one for actual financial losses on a, on a personal individual? Because I'd like to have an I mean, that's a really good, that's a really good question. I mean, I have, I mean, that's an area that I don't think I've looked into. I mean, I know what you mentioned is about the common sense approach. And I think, I mean, I mean, I hate to say that, but, you know, from a, I mean, I don't think there's anyone here that would argue that those are the things that we shouldn't do in a system, right? I mean, does anyone here say, well, no, we don't really need patch management. I think we would all say that's something that we need. So uh, it's common sense. But common sense doesn't, you know, you can't afford necessarily all, all these things. And I think it's probably the same thing with, there's probably personal policies, po riders to insurance policies that do that, but I don't know that anything that's going to give such a broad stroke of coverage. This is, well, we're going to cover the losses of any of your, the personal financial stuff of your customers. So all they can do, I guess you could sue them individually, I guess is what the argument would be. So, I'm sorry, I don't have more of an answer on that. Yes, ma'am. So, if somebody has a cyber attack, is there some sort of agency or entity that tracks this and goes after the bad guys? Well, it's an interesting question um, because um, from a, I mean, you, you would get, yes, the FBI. I mean, because basically at this point you're dealing with um, usually international, at least, at least probably almost certainly, 99% is probably international crime. They are, they are extorting you, so it is a crime, and they will go after them. And I think I saw the headlines yesterday that they've taken down two cybersecurity, I, I, I saw the headline, but I didn't get a chance to read it, but um, that they, they go after people. Um, the problem is that they've, they've really tried really, really hard, you know, to, 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 to hide things, and, um, but, but they're out there and, and they, they do go after them. And one of the arguments always was, do you report, I mean, it used to be, do you report it to the police? Because the first thing the cybersecurity insurance, cybersecurity bad actors say, don't contact the police. Well, I think there's now a law that if you're, I think you have to contact the police if that happens. Um, but, you know, obviously some companies would have preferred to keep things quiet and pay off the money and let them go, and hopefully things go away. But that's not always the way it works. That's usually, uh you mentioned the team that's available to the policy holder uh, and the lawyers were on the top. I happen to be a lawyer here. <laughs> but uh, that lawyer would be a breach coach, no. what you meant to say. And that's one of your first contacts after you've reported the breach to the insurance companies that they're going to give you comes back. In fact, it's part of your policy document tells you who the reach coach uh, firm is. We, we have had one in Wilmington, I know, because I'm sitting there. Uh, 
and, and, and we have weekly meetings where he always we always has that legal aspect to it. So I, I did, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I recognize, you know, to, to seeing a little face there, so. Yeah, so uh, that breach coach, and I've acted as a breach coach in some of the tabletop exercises, the grand and hires and what you'll just have me do it. But that breach coach is going to uh, direct your activities. When you contact the police, do you go straight to the FBI, do you go through your local law enforcement? But the main thing that you do on direction of your, and I don't have, and I was the deputy the insurance commissioner of Delaware, I don't, and even though I was, I don't have as negative a view of insurers as you did. Sorry. <laughs> it's not negative. I'm just, they're in the, they're in the, they're in the business to make money. I agree with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, the first call is to your side of the insurer. And they have, as you said, the array of services the breach code, are going to tell you, for instance, they're going to ask you, do you have any employees in other states? Oh, uh, yeah, we got that guy, Charlie, that works in California, and we got Bill, who works in Delaware, Vermont. Well, guess what? The notification requirements are all together different for California, all together different for the state. You have to satisfy each one of those. You can do that in coordination with the breach code. So I think there are many, many benefits. I, I don't agree with the idea of going without time insurance. I say the most important thing you need to do is find a broker, we have one, that is really knowledgeable in this, and they will help you through it. Don't talk to the insurance company yourself. For God's sake. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we had. broker that will act as the intermediary. They'll make sure you fill the box in properly. We work on our policy for like two months on that application and and I think there is a certain size of an organization where it's almost a mandatory type thing and I said I think Dover is like right right there you know and and I, I mean I'm not, I'm not against it I just know that our our bean counters are getting a little concerned about the amount of money that we're spending on cybersecurity insurance I guess the last thing I would say is um, if someone is questioning that, uh, take a look at Atlanta, take a look at Baltimore. Both of them said, no way, no, years ago, some years ago. Both of them said, Atlanta said, no, we're not paying a $75,000 rent. Guess what? It's so far, it's right around $7 million that they've spent mm -hmm. totally putting together a whole new system, all the time off, all the time the police couldn't operate, the fire couldn't operate. So you've got to think about those things too. If you say I'm going to go there, or if I'm going to follow FBI advice and not pay the uh, ransom, because what's the cost to your business of not paying? Can you afford that many months down? Oh well, I didn't pay the ransom. Well, guess what? You're bankrupt. How long you can be got to be down is that's a, definitely a key factor. Your management has to answer. I'm getting the hook back there. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us thank.